Let us pray together for the Lord's blessing on our time in his word. (laughs) Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here together this morning. And we pray that you would teach us through your holy word, that we might understand better this issue, this very important defining issue of our day, of abortion. Help us to think biblically and rationally about it. And we pray that you would bless us to that end this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Please turn in your Bible to Psalm 10. Here, continuing on in our series on a biblical theology of family, one of the topics we have to discuss, and it's fitting to do it in January as we're coming up to Sanctity of Life Sunday, is the issue of abortion. I've titled this morning's message, God's Song to Abortion Providers. Psalm 10. This is God's Word. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies and waits secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. But you have seen. For you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. May God bless the reading of his infallible word. Life is a precious gift from God. When I was a sophomore in college, my pastor showed me a video that was produced by Focus on the Family called The Hard Truth. And the opening minutes of that film showed the most unforgettable, horrific images and video footage I have ever seen in my life. It was worse than even the World War II Holocaust video documentaries I had seen when I was a little younger. My father was always a very outspoken advocate of the pro-life movement in that stance, and so I always understood that abortion was a great evil. But the horror of what abortion does to babies did not hit me until I saw that video when I was 19 years old. Those pictures and those videos were burned into my mind, and for about three weeks after that, I had no appetite and felt quite literally like I'd been kicked in the stomach. How could the world really be like this? I have also had to endure explaining to my children when they have reached a certain age what abortion is. I've prayed against it in front of them since it is one of the defining issues of our time. I still remember the looks on their faces. How does one explain a saline abortion to a 13-year-old? How does one tell a 14-year-old what dilation and curatage means? How do you tell a 15-year-old what partial birth abortion is? A few years ago, I embarked on a fairly in-depth study of abortion, This was due in part to the fact that one of the most notoriously evil abortion providers in North America, Dr. Martin Haskell, opened a late-term freestanding abortion clinic less than two miles from the church where I was an assistant pastor. Dr. Haskell invented partial birth abortion. In fact, I read his paper that he published on that. In studying abortion and trying to understand how we got to where we are, I was reminded of the date when abortion became legalized in the United States, January 22nd, 1973. I was born in March of 1975. My mother could have chosen to exercise her so-called right to choose and could have paid someone to kill me. I called her and thanked her for giving birth to me. 
My dear mother, who had prayed and prayed and prayed for another child, told me, Patrick, I wanted you more than you could imagine. I absolutely loved being pregnant with you. I was a very blessed person because, according to the statistics today, one in three children conceived on American soil will be aborted. Imagine it. One third. One third of the people who would have been part of your life are gone. How did we get here? Very quickly, I'd like to give you a brief sketch about how Roe versus Wade came about. There's so much that could go into this discussion. There's so much philosophical background we could go into, but it would take too long to do that as I want to allow Psalm 10 to speak to us. But very briefly, I want everyone listening to know exactly what abortion is. Easy abortion on demand has nothing whatsoever to do with women's rights. Easy abortion on demand has nothing whatsoever to do with saving women's lives. Easy abortion on demand has nothing whatsoever to do with a woman's so-called right to choose. It has nothing to do with privacy. It has nothing to do with taking away a woman's sovereignty over her own body. Abortion, plainly stated, is a backup plan for failed contraception. That's all it is. That's all it's ever been. <clears throat> Every time you see people holding up signs that say, not your body, not your choice, or trust women, or pro-choice, or abortion saves women's lives, you can know for sure that those individuals are utterly ignorant of what I'm about to tell you and have been simply manipulated to believe the shallow propaganda of the self-centered ideologues who pushed this upon our nation, not through the legislature, mind you, but through, unappointed judge, to, through unelected judges at the Supreme Court. Let me give you some brief background. Please, please listen carefully. In 1953, Margaret Sanger, the founder of what was then called the American Birth Control League, known today as Planned Parenthood, persuaded a rich, frustrated, anti-child feminist named Catherine McCormick to bankroll hormone experiments on women. So they found 897 test subjects, women who were married, who did not want children, who were willing to be the, the test rats for these hormone experiments. And lo and behold, it worked. No babies. But the side effects were rather disastrous from the pill. This pill, while it did work, was found to cause blood clots, heart attacks, cancer, strokes, depression, weight gain, and a loss of libido. And so they continued working and working and working on this, scaling back the amount of estrogen that was in the birth control pill in order to curtail the side effects. And that worked too. The side effects were mitigated. But one of the side effects of cutting back on the amount of estrogen put in those pills was they didn't work as well. They didn't always prevent ovulation. And so now you have an entire group of women, an entire generation of women who are sexually active but do not want children, and they're getting pregnant. Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade is simply the backup plan for failed contraceptives. That's all it is. That's all it's ever been. And I would point out as well that abortion is also the ultimate exploitation of women. Women are used and abused by the abortion industry for money. All of the shallow lies about women's rights and all the rest of it is a smokescreen. Abortion is about money. It is about exploiting women and using them to make money. Abortion is an industry in America. In fact, it is a very largely unregulated cash-only industry that is bizarre and frightening to study. I have read the testimonies of former abortion clinic workers, former abortion doctors who have come to their senses and are now outspoken pro-life advocates because of the unspeakable brutality of what they saw happening in these abortion clinics. I read a story about a reporter who was chewing out and arguing with pro-life people outside of a clinic where partial birth abortions were being performed. And finally, a doctor from the inside came out and motioned to the reporter to come inside. And the doctor said, just come in here and watch one and you'll see there's nothing to fuss about. The reporter was profoundly shaken by what he saw and changed his stance from then on. An article in the New York Times by a very liberal pro-abortion woman writer was also stunning. She attended and observed a partial birth abortion and described it as, quote, profoundly disturbing. And also said she found it difficult to hold her own eight-month-old baby when she returned home. And the final line of that article by a pro, pro-abortion feminist liberal author in the New York Times, she said, and I quote, I have seen that fetus in my dreams, end quote. 
Now, Psalm 10 does not speak directly to the issue of abortion, but the, the parallels are obvious. Did you hear them as we were reading the psalm? I'd like to walk you through this psalm right now. Let's look at it. I've given you a three-point outline there and some, some, some things to look at for Sabbath discussion, meditation with your family this afternoon. But the first point is the poverty of, helpless, of the helpless unborn. The poverty of the helpless unborn. Let's look at the first two verses. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. There are few things more emotionally painful than knowing what happens to thousands of unborn babies every day in our nation. Right up in Bristol, right up in Bristol, Tennessee, is the Bristol Regional Women's Center. And the homepage of their website reads, and I quote, Our center offers surgical abortions for women whose pregnancy age is from six weeks and three days up to 14 weeks, as well as medical abortions for women whose pregnancy is 56 days or less from the first day of their last menstrual period, end quote. 20-minute drive, they're killing babies. It is good and righteous to pray for God's judgment upon his enemies. Yes, we pray for the salvation of the lost, and we pray for their souls, that they will come to their senses and come to know Christ. But those who have set themselves against God in vile, bold, and notoriously wicked ways, as abortion providers do, are recognized in the word of God as the wicked. The wicked. Those who make their living in this world on the backs of the poor by committing unending acts of injustice upon the innocent, And who in their pride do all that is in their power to ignore the cries of their consciences. We pray with the psalmist here in verse 2. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. Those who use their God created and God given hands. And their God given strength to murder unborn children for money. Must be prayed against by the church. We have to pray that God would stop them. That God would bring that to an end. And we must cry out with the psalmist here. Why do you stand afar off? Oh Lord, why do you hide in times of trouble? And if you've ever stood in front of an abortion clinic and watched person after person after person. Young lady after young lady after young lady walking in there. And you know what they're doing in there. You can't help but pray this. Why do you let this happen? Why do you stand afar off? All of us feel this. How can God allow such things to happen? Why won't he change the hearts of fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers, parents and grandparents to love these babies? Notice again that the wicked here, it says, persecutes who? The poor. If the parents of the preborn child do not love them or do not want them, I would simply ask the question, what does that preborn child have? Nothing. They are the poorest of the poor. And the mother who discards and turns her back on them And the abortion provider who gets paid to kill them, they are persecuting the poor. The preborn child in America has a very precarious existence. The preborn child's poverty is really difficult to understand. The preborn child has no rights, no rights under our nation's laws. It has no possessions, it has no means of self defense, being the weakest and smallest member of society. And therefore, the only thing the preborn child might have is a mother and a father that love them. This is what will sadly determine whether or not that child will be born. All of us in this room who are sitting here alive, who were born after Roe versus Wade, we had mothers and or fathers who at least loved us enough to have us, not to exercise their so-called right to choose whether we would live or die. Point number two, Satan's captives who do his will. Look at, this is a longer section, verses 3 through 13. Before we look at verse 3, I wanted to make a brief comment. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 26 says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. The servants of Satan rarely acknowledge or believe themselves to be doing evil. Most abortion providers think they're doing good. They think they're providing a service. They think they're helping people. 
In fact, most evil people don't think that they're doing evil either. Hitler, Stalin, Robespierre, Margaret Sanger, and a host of others all thought that they were doing good. They all thought they were doing good by loving humanity so much that they felt the obligation to obliterate everyone that stood in the way of its forward progress. But we must recognize that there are indeed human beings who have been taken captive by the devil to do his will. And it says in the scripture that the the teacher of God's word is to be humble in correcting them. If perhaps God would grant them repentance, those who have been taken captive by him to do his will. And make no mistake about it, my friends, abortion providers are the emissaries of Satan. They are doing Satan's uh, his will, and those abortion clinics are the gates of hell. Anywhere you see murder, there is the work of Satan. Jesus described the devil in very haunting terms to his opposition in John 8, 44. He told his enemies, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. He's a murderer. He was a murderer from the beginning. Needless and senseless annihilation of innocent human life is one of Satan's most recognizable footprints in the world. Where you see innocent life being poured out like water, like it means nothing. There you see the work of the devil. And the abortion clinics of the world are the temples where Satan is worshipped by his priests, the abortion providers, and worshipped by his followers, those who offer their children freely as sacrifices to their desires. Now look at verses 3 and 4 there in Psalm 10. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire, he blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. One of the most detestable deities that was worshipped in ancient times was named Molech. He was placated by the blood of innocent children. Even the Israelites themselves ended up worshipping Molech by offering their own born and living children as burnt offerings to this satanic deity. God gave the Israelites a very stern warning about doing that in Leviticus chapter 20. Listen carefully to these words. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people, because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from that man, when he gives some of his descendants to Molech and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and his family. Do you hear that? The guy who fails to stone him, I'll set my face against him and his family too. I'll set my face against that man and his family and I will cut him off from his people. All who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. That's Leviticus 20 verses 1 through 5. Molech lives in America today, folks, but he's changed his name. Today, we call Molech convenience. Today, we call Molech choice, rights, liberty, freedom, and a whole host of other names. But if you peel back the disguise, it's it's still him. It's still Molech. Notice again verses 3 and 4. The wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Okay, think about that for a moment. Sure, people do not believe that they are making a sacrifice to Satan himself, but remember what Jesus taught us, what the whole Bible teaches us. Men are worshipers by nature. If you renounce the Lord and God is in none of your thoughts, when you offer sacrifices, who are you sacrificing to? The enemy. Everything we do, all of our priorities, our decisions, our affections, all that we give up or sacrifice and set aside. All of it's an act of worship. All of it is an act of worship to that which we value most in life. Men are religious by nature. They can't help themselves. And if they're not serving and loving their creator, it's not that they've decided to stop being religious altogether. It is merely that they have chosen a different God to worship. Themselves. Convenience. Vanity. Choice. Career. Whatever you want to call it. But the one who makes his living, the one who makes his living off of persecuting the poor and helpless, 
This one blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. He does not seek God, and God is in none of his thoughts. Look at verse 5. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. Okay, stop there. Those who prosper on the backs of the poor and who cash in by murdering the innocent, the judgments of God are, as the passage says, far above, out of his sight. He has no fear of God. He sleeps like a baby at night. He plans his future. All will be well. He piles up his money and checks his, his account balances on the internet regularly. And as for this person's enemies, he sneers at them. The Hebrew word that's translated as sneers is the word puach. Puach. It means to bluff, to, uh, to blow, puff, or snort. What do they do towards their enemies? They snort at them. They puff air at them. Did you know Dr. Haskell used to do that to us all the time? We would try to get his attention when he pulled up in his gold Cadillac. Hey, Dr. Haskell. He would look at us. God inspired that 3,000 years ago. He even knows how they treat their enemies. What do they do? Do they offer an apologetical defense? Can they argue for their position? No, they just snort at us. They puff at us. They puach at us. Dr. Haskell did that all the time. Many other abortion providers have done the same thing. George Tiller who was murdered in 2009, was notorious for cursing at pro-life advocates, making obscene gestures towards them, snorting at them, sneering at them, yelling at them. Here you have men who have personally murdered tens of thousands of unborn children and made themselves filthy rich doing it. And what do they do towards those that stand there at the gates of hell to protest and speak in behalf of the unborn? They sneer at them. They puff at them. They blow air at them. That's their great defense of what they're doing. They sneer at the people that try to call them out. They've put the judgment of God far from their mind, out of their sight, so much so that all they can do is mock and spit at people who oppose their murderous ways. Look at verses 6 through 10. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I will never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the village. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. Okay, stop there. The unrepentant abortion provider thinks he'll never be moved. That he will never face adversity. They curse and swear and oppress people. Their high-paid lawyers have connections in the local governments, and they know all the legal loopholes. And there he sits, in the lurking places of the villages, in those secret places behind those bricks and mortar. There he sits, dismembering, burning, and crushing the precious bodies of the innocents. Verses 8b through 10, look at the second part of verse 8 again, contains a very stirring image. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. Now think about that. Think about that image. They aim at the weakest and the most helpless. They don't want to fight. They don't want to have to put up with someone struggling. They want everything to be just right. It's, it's secret. Everyone's in agreement. The, the person they're murdering can't fight at all. And so they destroy the poor. The poor, the unborn child who has nobody to protect him or her. And they prey upon the helpless. That unborn child does not have the size or the physical strength to see what is coming so that it might run or defend itself. What would you do if you saw someone coming at you with saline solution that they wanted to pour all over you to burn you to death? What would you do if you saw someone coming with knives and forceps that they wanted to clamp down on your head, your arms, your legs, in order to dismember you and kill you? And yet here comes the abortion provider with his instruments of death, and that poor little person cannot stop them, and he cannot defend himself or herself. Our laws won't protect them or stop them. These are horrific times in which we live, and all this in the name of convenience. All this innocent bloodshed in the name of of birth control. 
Always remember that. Abortion is simply the final step of birth control. And remember, Planned Parenthood was originally called the American Birth Control League when it was founded in 1921 by Margaret Sanger. That's what it was called, the American Birth Control League. And they decided, well, that title, it sounds a little too controlling, the American Birth Control League. So we'll make it a different title. We'll make it sound like we're empowering the people. You can plan for parenthood. We'll help you plan for parenthood, even though the only way we make money is if you don't plan for parenthood. Abortion is a backup for failed contraception. I'd like to give a quotation from Margaret Sanger, a woman who was called the angel of death by George Grant in a biography he wrote about her with that title, in her own words, about the purposes of the American Birth Control League, about the purposes of Planned Parenthood. Here's what Margaret Sanger said, and I quote, Our objective is unlimited sexual gratification without the burden of unwanted children. Women must have the right to live, to love, to be lazy, to be an unmarried mother, to create and to destroy. The marriage bed is the most degenerative influence in the social order. The most merciful thing that a family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. End quote. Your tax money goes to that organization now. Look at verse 11 in Psalm 10. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, You will not require an account. Okay, stop there. Please understand that just as God knows that the murderers of the poor, innocent, and defenseless will puff, sneer, and blow wind at their enemies, God also knows what they think in their hearts. He knows what that abortion provider thinks about when he lays down on his pillow at night. And they have always thought the same thing. They do not live in fear of giving an account of their actions to God because they are so completely deluded by Satan that they actually think God has forgotten. Did you hear that in the text? They say in their hearts, God has forgotten. God hides his face. God will never see what I'm doing. He'll never see all the innocent blood that I have shed. And when this psalm says in verse 4 regarding the wicked that God is in none of his thoughts, that is literally true. Those filthy rich abortion providers who have lined their pockets with blood money, they renounce God and they never think about him or his judgment. It ought to frighten us how powerful the blinding effects of sin are in our lives. What people want to be true often has a profound effect on what they think is true. And then in the final section here, the psalmist calls out for judgment upon them. Look at verses 14. And following, look at verse 14 there. Speaking of God, which you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief, to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the follower of the fatherless. God does see. God shall repay it. The scales of justice shall be balanced, either by these people repenting and coming to know Christ or by their being cast into hell fire. And notice the second sentence again. It says, the helpless. Again, who could be more helpless than an unborn child? The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Think about that. The fatherless. Someone without a dad. Fathers are supposed to protect their children. Guard their children. My father used to look at me in the eyes when I was a teenager. And even before that, even because when he, when he annoyed me, he could tell that, that I was upset at him. And he would grab me by the shoulders and look in my eyes and say, Patrick, I want you to know that I love you and I would kill and die for you. Don't ever doubt that. And here you have fatherless, unborn children. Nobody to protect them. No one that loves them. And in the case of abortion, you have fathers willing not only to allow it to happen, but to pay someone to do it. And therefore, in that sense, these preborn innocents are fatherless. They have no one. And the psalmist then becomes a little more, a little more animated. Look at verses 15 to the end of the chapter there, 15 through 18. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. 
Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Oh, make no mistake about it. God will do justice for the fatherless and the oppressed and the poor innocents. Not a single drop of innocent blood. No one gets away with it. Even as the abortion provider tells himself, God has hidden his face. He will never require an account. I shall never be moved. I will never be in adversity. When we remember the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, we see the demonstration of the holy justice of God. It happened in real space-time history. Is there a God who is holy? Oh, yes, there is. You can tell yourself all day long it's not going to happen. Jesus bled real blood. Those were real whips that came down on his back. Those were real nails sticking to, stuck into his hands. That was real agony. That was real wrath and justice poured out on him. It is real. It happened in history. We remember those three hours of darkness. We remember the earthquake, his agonized words from the cross. We know that the guilt of mankind is so very real. We know that God's holiness is so very real and that divine justice against sin is so very real. As miserably deluded as so many are about these facts, we must do all that we can to remind ourselves and all mankind that there most certainly is a day of judgment. The oppressors of the poor and the helpless, they will have their brief moment in the sun. They will scoff and sneer at their opponents, but it will be very, very brief. They will hear the summons of Christ one day to judgment. And in that moment, every man's heart will melt and they shall stare at one another amazed and fearful as their verdict is read. The Westminster Larger Catechism, taking account of innumerable passages of scripture, asks the question in question 89, what shall be done to the wicked at the day of judgment? Answer, at the day of judgment, the wicked shall be set on Christ's left hand. And upon clear evidence and full conviction of their own consciences shall have the fearful but just sentence of condemnation pronounced against them and thereupon shall be cast out from the favorable presence of God and the glorious fellowship with Christ, his saints, and all his holy, holy angels into hell to be punished with unspeakable torments both of body and soul with the devil and his angels forever. Paul describes the second coming in these frightening words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, he says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. No one gets away with anything, despite how hard they work to hide this from themselves. God does see, God does know. God will require an account and it is because Christians know this, that they have repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and know, alone for salvation. If God truly knows all things and is going to judge me, my only hope is in the righteousness of another. In the righteousness of the one perfect man who ever lived, our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus. Abortion was and is marketed as a source of freedom, liberation, and progress. The truth is, however... That abortion is the exploitation of women in crisis. For all of the feminist support of abortion rights, it is women who are the victims of abortion. There is no excuse for abortion. Brothers, sisters, friends, anyone listening to this, there's no excuse for it. There never has been an excuse for it, but especially not today. Everyone has always known that it was a baby. Everyone has always known that abortion was murder. But the simple fact is, from a scientific standpoint, we know more about the preborn child than any other generation in the history of mankind. We can see them with ultrasounds in four dimensions. There is no scientific, moral, or societal excuse for this senseless slaughter of humanity to continue. None. When abortion providers tell women... 15 minutes in here will solve all your problems. They are lying. They're exploiting, using, dehumanizing those women and their unborn children. I worked with a woman who did counseling with, at a woman's help center. In fact, she was the one we tried to get people to go talk to. And for 15 years of doing that, she had talked that she knew of 739 women out of having abortions. 739 women who came to her, abortion-minded she helped change their mind. 
She told me that not one of them regretted having their babies. 739 out of 739 were thankful that they did not go through with it. Whether they kept the babies or gave them up for adoption, they were thankful they did not have an abortion. Women do not regret having their babies. They regret abortion. Our hearts break for the children whose lives are spilled out like water. We're outraged at doctors who murder them for money. But in the long run, I want to make something very, very clear to all of us. In the long run, who loses because of abortion? Everyone. There are no winners. I have a book here. I've had this book for a number of years. And as you can see, I haven't gotten very far into it. I can't read it. It's called Giving Sorrow Words. Women's Stories of Grief After Abortion. It's a litany of grief. And I wanted to read to you very briefly a few paragraphs from one of these women. She wrote, A week later I was in the hospital for the abortion. I remember... The preceding week fairly well. I spent most of it in bed dreaming of my baby, pretending to myself that if I lay there long enough, I'd give birth before the abortion took place. My body felt soft and rolly. My nostrils were overwhelmed by the smell of lavender. I had been packing bags with lavender for extra money. Protocol had me meet with a doctor. My partner was present. I could not speak. Were they going to ask me if I wanted the abortion? I waited. No questions asked. The day drew near and panic set in. I remember one night being so alarmed by pain in my womb that I was convinced I was miscarrying. I ran to the hospital and burst into tears as they streamed down my face. A nurse said, what does it matter? You're going to have an abortion anyway. I slunk away. The day of the procedure, my partner fell asleep on the hospital bed while I sat and waited to be taken into the theater. He was tired and exhausted and upset. I was feeling ill-fated. They took me away. On the operating table, they proceeded to administer the anesthetic. I looked into the anesthetic's face. I said no, but they performed the operation anyway. No last-minute absolution in this place. Oh, I felt so betrayed. I, I tried to see things this way. This nameless, faceless being, which I could put on hold for a while and create again when the time was more appropriate. But there was always a face and always a name. From the very beginning, I felt connected to my baby and believed that I could see him. I even named him, but I do not care to repeat that name these days. For many months after the termination, I woke during the night to hear my baby screaming. Sometimes confused, I would get up and look for him. Other times I thought, this is my punishment, and lay awake and forced myself to listen until he settled down. Eventually, after many months, the screaming turned to crying and then to whimpering and then to sniffling. One day it stopped altogether, but this was not the end. To this day, I feel him around me. Sometimes he is more present than at other times. Sometimes I open my arms and embrace the air as if I'm holding on to something tangible. Mostly I just talk to him with my hands, making gestures in the air to demonstrate a thought or a sentence or to share an interesting view. Or I might run my hands around the smoothness of his face. I know that there is nothing there, but these are the impulses which I carry out without thinking. I lost my child, and my relationship broke down. I felt so betrayed I could no longer sleep with him. I do see him around. We are in the same profession. He once told me that he was devastated that I had listened to him then. He holds this wish that I had said no to him and continued with the pregnancy. We both grieve, but we do so alone. Who loses because of abortion? Everybody does. Everyone involved. The lost soul of the abortion provider becomes more lost. The mother loses her child and loses an intact conscience. Marriages are lost. Mother-child intimacy. Father-child intimacy is lost. Fatherhood is lost. The ability to bond with children is lost. The unborn child is lost. Innocence is lost. Life is lost. And we all sit together in the smoldering ashes left behind. Behold, everyone born since January 22, 1973, we are the survivors of the Holocaust. I want to conclude on a positive note here. The Word of God issues the command to married people, be fruitful and multiply. The world you live in has made its position quite clear. Paraphrasing Psalm 127, here's how the world sees it. Behold, children are a burden. 
and an economic drain. Like bills that continue to pile on more debt, so are the children of, one, of one's youth. Worn out, tired, and hindered from his true potential is the man who has his quiver full of them. They will be ashamed and powerless against their enemies. That's the message of the world you live in today. That's the message of the culture of death. Contrast that in closing with what God says. Psalm 127, verse 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Pray that it would end. Pray that it would end. And look at children as a blessing. Look at all the children in this little church of ours. They're everywhere. Every time I turn around, I'm tripping over one. It's a blessing. They're wonderful. We praise God for that. That we have, what, 35 or 36 now in a church this size? What a blessing. They're a blessing to us. Children are a good thing. They're a blessing. Whatever circumstances they're conceived in, they're a blessing. However God sees fit to make them healthy or unhealthy. The passage does not qualify it. They are a blessing. They always are a blessing. Turn away from the culture around you. Learn to think biblically about this issue. Children are a blessing from God. They're a reward from him. And happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we grieve over the lives that have been lost through abortion, the unborn children who were discarded. But we also remember the women and men, as there are over 55 million unborn children who have lost their lives, we know that there are twice, twice as many parents who have also lost their children. We pray, Lord, that you would bring beauty out of the ashes, that you would bring revival, that you would turn the hearts of your people And turn the hearts of this nation back to the children to see them as a blessing, not as a burden, not as an inconvenience, but as a blessing that you sovereignly give us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.